Welcome to the Benefits of Collaboration webinar being run by APM's Benefits Management Special Interest Group. My name is Bruce Phillips. I'm a member of the Benefits Management SIG Committee. I am delighted to introduce our two speakers. Those two James-esque characters on the slide are David Hawkins, who is the Operations Director and Knowledge Architect at the ICW and uh, Andrew Hudson, who is the Managing Director at Change uh, Director, both very experienced and capable uh, individuals. What is not debatable today is looking at the world in terms of re redefining e economy. We used to have an industrial economy, we now end up with a network from vertical integration to virtual integration. The world is changing, Relationships are key, but management of relationships still remains largely ad hoc and often too frequently left to individuals rather than embedded within the organization. It was this challenge that we saw back in the early 2000s as to how do we, how do we transform the thinking within organizations. So realigning the mindset. Um, sounds pompous, but actually if you take the, uh, the two pictures on there, I don't know uh, your experiences, but certainly mine, a huge amount of effort is spent by organizations and individuals pulling against each other in a traditional adversarial approach, providing lack of, driven by lack of clarity, conflicting objectives, different agendas, internal stress, wasted effort, but most importantly, failed outcomes. And when I talk to executives, I like to look, try to liken them to the donkeys, which is if they'd actually sit down and talk to each other across their organizational boundaries, they could work out more pro productive and approaches to getting a collaborative outcome. Clarity of purpose, joint objectives, complementary skills, optimized resources, joint management, integrated processes, but most importantly, mutual benefit. If we all don't win, in the end, nobody wins. So moving this forward, we looked at the uh, concept of, of how important are relationships and I'll put that into perspective where visiting organizations if you ask what is the biggest risk to your project or your outcome the answer will be that the relationships fall down between the customers the developers the suppliers and it often internally and Yet, when I ask to look at where the risks are in the programs, I can very infrequently find a reference in risk management or project management to supporting proactive relationships. So looking at the iceberg, you know, we're really good as organizations at developing policy skills, systems, structures. What we often forget, and particularly in this age of technology, is that it's actually people that make these things happen. It's the informal relationships which are driven by organizations, individuals from top to bottom. People make the difference. So you look now and BS 11000 was fairly unique in its approach which to my knowledge was the first national standard ever to address competencies, culture and behaviors. And I think this is the big challenge for industry and the world of project management going forward, is that yes, we have the systems and processes, but do we have the capabilities, the skills, the competencies to meet these new challenges? And if we can identify what skills we do have, do we actually invest in developing those skills for the next generation of project managers? So, behaviors are important, but what drives the behavior? From an individual perspective, leadership and management, systems and incentives. From a stakeholder community, the economics of programs will drive in. 
on the broader front, politics and regulation, nationality and society, and where you're working in multinational programs, it's very easy to understand how these pressures can build up on individuals. So behaviours become critical. I've included here a few examples because often when I talk to companies about collaboration, the answer is, well, it's all, re it's all very well for the big infrastructure projects. But I identified a few items here where you can see that even in small programs, significant savings can be made if we actually talk to each other, work together, and look at solutions rather than responsibilities or accusations. This slide will be no surprise to most of you working on major projects and major infrastructure programs. We have become exceedingly complex in the way that we drive and develop these programs forward. But as you see the links between these organizations, any one of these elements can become a critical fault factor when looking at the outcomes that are desired. Whether that's the end user or the equipment provider, the manufacturer or the supplier, even the financial institutions today are looking at projects to say, are we viable in terms of can these organizations work together? Uh, my experience is as you drift around these different communities, you even find an, uh, a lack of commonality in language. And I gather we have some friends on the, on the webinar from the US. I think it was, uh, what is it, one nation divided by a language? So if we can't understand the complexities of what we're dealing with, how can we expect to get the results we desire? The latest move in technology, and I think it's terrific stuff, is the introduction of BIM. And the technology, I think, is marvelous. But what I fail to see right now are the benefits of the technology being hamstrung by the fact that we need to get make sure that we have the right people involved with the right attitudes and the right competencies to drive the bus in the right direction. In fact, I have a thing about technology being old and grey, and that is that uh, the technology is wonderful, but if you remember, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and then had to wait 18 months for somebody to call. So we can push the buttons, but if we push them in the wrong order and with the wrong attitude, we're likely to get the wrong result. Project strategy, and I think this is where we have to start thinking about how do we make collaboration work effectively. And those of you who have uh, indulged in my favorite topic of Sun Tzu, um, you will recognize that it's not about winning the battle, it's about winning the war. Unfortunately, from my experience over 40 years in the construction industry, we are frequently trained and even incentivized to win battles in functional isolation and inevitably end up losing the war. So, introducing BS 11000, what is it? It's the first national standard of its type published anywhere in the world. It provides an alternative business model to get organizations on the same platform talking about the real issues and not the egos and positioning. It helps to create an environment of trust because we are all talking the same language. And it contains a detailed approach as a framework, not a dictate, on how organizations can work together. Drawing back to my comment earlier on, no two relationships will ever be the same. The framework itself is relatively simple, an eight-step model. The first thing you have to do in any organization is to understand where the leadership is and what the objectives of the business are. My own experiences of trying to develop collaborative relationships in the past have often failed because the senior executives in the company didn't like the idea. They'll let you run until it goes wrong, and when it goes wrong, the fingers start pointing. So if collaboration is to work, it has to be embedded at the executive level and cascaded through the organization. 
The next stage, knowledge, is around strategy. Does collaboration make sense? Is it the right, or is it the right solution in every case? The answer to that is no. I think in many cases where we have uh, standard products, standard materials, standard services, we don't need complex relationships. We need to choose, pick and choose how we do it. Those who remember the early 90s and the fad for partnering will also be aware that statistically I think 80% of partnerships were deemed to be failures. Um, mainly because half of them never should be, they didn't make sense, and because the other half weren't managed particularly well. The third step is around knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And in this particular case, many organizations will dictate collaboration but fail to understand whether they're capable, capable internally of delivering it. Finding the right partner. There's a real challenge for you. If you want to be collaborative, how do you evaluate the partners, you, the potential partners to work with? The old days, it was very easy. When I started in procurement in the 60s, it was price, quality, and delivery. And if you could get two out of the three, you were doing really well. Today, we're looking at integrated relationships, cultures, behaviors, running across multiple organizational boundaries. So those first four steps are really what was missing in the early 90s. We got into contracting arrangements and then decided to partner. Our view is that by following a more methodical approach, we should lay the foundations within the organization first. So we get to working together, establishing the appropriate governance for joint working. Not us and them, but us together. I hear lots of stories about win-win, but I believe there's only one win. If we all win, that's great. If one, only one of us wins, nobody wins. Value creation, I guess it's a simple process. If we've got the right relationships, we should be continually looking for something new, something additional, benefit, not a slicker working. Staying together, and this is particularly important on long-term projects where people changes over time can actually change the dynamics of the relationship. But do we actually measure those relationships and maintain the ethos that we started with? And the final stage, often looked on very negatively, the exit strategy. Where actually if you've invested two or three, maybe five years in building a relationship, you should also make sure that it finishes in an adequate way and appropriately for both parties and maybe move on to a new stage of the relationship. My experience in Project World over the last 40 years was the fact that I never ever finished a project and great projects were failures because the night watchman didn't finish the paperwork. So we need to wrap these things up well. So benefits of BS 11,000, public-private sector, common language, consistency of approach, better risk management, processes and systems supporting collaboration, resource development that is targeted to bring out the best in people, efficiency and effectiveness. Pan industry was a big issue for us um, that it wasn't de the standard wasn't developed about one industry, it was developed across a series of industries. And, and today with these complex projects, that's essential. Getting a finance and an IT guy to have the same language is really difficult. And of course, we have a collaborative benchmark. Of the benefits in the middle, I guess the, the most important one is if it's going to be collaborative, it has to be a neutral starting point. It cannot be, you will collaborate, it must be, we will collaborate. I included here some of the early adopters to the standard, just to give you an idea of those companies that are already taking this to heart, and many of them are supporting the development to take this to an international standard. So I guess to get close to my closing, um, this was a recent publication, was a research project commissioned by the Institute to look at where chief executives saw the value of collaboration. 
And what was really interesting for us, or supportive of our views, was actually collaboration. The, the least important issue was around lower operating costs. The biggest issue was better problem solving. And if you ask a chief executive if you got what you wanted, when you wanted, at the price you agreed to pay, would you be satisfied? And most would turn around and say, if we did that, we'd be doing really well. New research we have in hand now is focusing on how do we identify who those collaborative individuals are in our organizations. So to close, BS 11,000 is about better business, sustainable relationships, continual improvement. It's not about a certificate on the wall. It's a different way of working. And now I'd like to hand over to Andrew, who will give you his views on collaborative benefits. Thanks very much, David. Uh, my name is Andrew Hudson, and I'm the founder of Change Director, which has been assisting organizations to measure and realize value through better practices and tools over several years now. And I'm delighted to share some of my thoughts and insights about benefits realization from a collaborative perspective. So one way of looking at this is to think about how organizations work in practice. So if we look at the, the three key areas of governance, change, and running business as usual, governance involves the leadership team coming together to agree on what the strategy is and setting out clearly the objectives, KPIs, measures, and targets, typically in a balanced call card format. As part of that, they'll need to be clear on how the strategy is going to be executed. So that will involve an investment in a number of change projects, which could be new products, so research and development, and new capabilities, which could be IT, people, or process change. And in terms of running the operation, for commercial organizations, you'll have marketing and sales, and operations and servicing functions. You may also have projects which are being delivered, maybe large capital delivery projects. And supporting all that, you've got the functions of human resources, legal risk, finance and technology. So let's look at some of the causes of benefits realization failure. And I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the statistics that only 25% of projects actually realize the intended outcomes. Whereas most organizations deliver projects, it's very rare that you actually see the results. And one of the causes of failure there is not actually knowing what the outcomes are. So let me talk you through some of the uh, pain points here around uh, the practice. Um, one of the challenges, whilst an organization might have a strategy, it's often not well articulated. So an important part there is to actually set out clearly what the objectives are for the organization, being clear on who's accountable for each objective, and setting out the right measures that you can then see whether the strategy is being executed or not. If that doesn't happen, it makes it difficult then to be clear on how the projects are aligned with the organization's strategy. And one of the challenges there is to make sure that you're actually doing the right projects. Um, if you've got a project that's worth doing, you shouldn't be waiting um, months to actually get the next budget for the next year, but actually getting on with it versus other projects which might not be delivering any value. So another pressure point is actually getting the right projects and making sure that those are aligned with the strategy and this not part of an overall budgeting process, which tends to happen on an annual basis where functional teams will be looking to see that they get the uh, budget in place, uh, but that doesn't necessarily get reviewed on a quarterly or a more frequent basis to make sure you're doing the right things. And teams will be looking to see that they actually get the spend the money that's allocated rather than not. If we look at projects and programs, they tend to focus on uh, deadlines and budgets as opposed to the outcomes. So an important part of the project delivery is being very clear on what the value is that's to be delivered. So rather than just starting from the business case to get the investment in the project, making sure that you're still going to deliver those outcomes. In terms of change transition, uh, there are often challenges in terms of the amount of change that's going on in organizations that's very difficult to control and difficulties with managing stakeholders and uh, seeing the transition through into the organization. And one of the challenges as well around benefit realization is that the benefits shouldn't really be led by the projects but actually managed by the organizations themselves. 
So the beneficiaries should be taking more account for the benefits that are being realized rather than just focusing on the, the benefits and seeing that the change is delivered. So a good example of being clear on strategy is one where we have an NHS organization that found that when it talked to its uh, managers, found that most of them didn't know what the strategy was. So by drawing out a clear picture of the strategy <coughs> and getting people to, to share that and communicate on it, found that they were getting better engagement, which was very important because a, a key lever of discretionary effort in organizations is people knowing what the strategy is and what the contribution is, uh, what their contribution is to it. So having a clear basis of the strategy, in this example we've got a set of strategic themes and these could be broken down into individual objectives and we can see here that we've got um, clearly set out accountabilities for each of those objectives at the, at the strategic theme level. So when it comes to decision making, one of the challenges is getting people to be more objective about which projects they're going to do, so avoiding the challenge of having pet projects where people will be trying to push their case for their projects as opposed to looking at it in the round and seeing getting consensus in terms of mutual objectives. So one of the challenges there is to see that we're far clearer on what are we trying to achieve. So this example shows you where we've looked at a, where we're looking at the remaining costs against the strategic alignment. And in this case, you can see that there are a number of projects which are relatively high in terms of spend and relatively low in terms of strategic alignment. We've also got a view here that shows the remaining cost against the risk. So we may want to rebalance the projects that we're investing in so there's a better balance in terms of risk or maybe finding mitigating actions to reduce the risks. And then to balance that all out by looking at um, the costs, the benefits, the strategic alignment and risk to decide which of the initiatives that are worth investing in. Um, a good example of this was um, an airline that had a £200 million um, investment pot of initiatives, but their primary goal was to actually um, break even if not make a small profit, and at the time they were making about a £100 million loss. And when the leadership team got together, they realized that actually some of the initiatives weren't going to deliver much value in the next year or two, despite a very high investment. And once they'd collectively gone back to the overall objective of breaking even and making a small profit, they actually were able to make a decision between themselves, well actually let's postpone these initiatives for a couple of years, focus on these more tactical initiatives, and we're able to turn around the business within a year to bring it back to break even. So these are very powerful techniques and not ones that you just use on an annual budgeting basis, but as an ongoing process, potentially even monthly, to make sure that you're doing the right things. Some of you may be familiar with the Chaos Manifesto. Uh, the Standish Group has been producing a report for the last 20 years and it had traditionally focused on time, cost and quality as a measure of project success. But when they went back to some of the projects which were perceived to be successful and asked the business, well, were they, were they successful for you? They found that they hadn't actually delivered much, if any, value. And when asked, so which of the projects that did deliver value, many of those were over budget and very late. So they've decided now to refocus their measure of project success, not just on time, cost and quality, but on value as being the overriding objective. So one of the things here is that the, um, it's not just about getting your business case approved, but about continuing to review the benefits and see whether those projects are still delivering the value that was expected. One way of looking at benefits, rather than from a project perspective, is to actually go back to the beneficiaries and look at benefit measures as a closed loop. So if we were to take, let's say, the spend for last year at, say, 650 million, and then if we had no change, where would the spend get to this year? That could be circa 680 million. The organization is actually looking to reduce costs by 7 or 8 percent, so that would require a, a targeted saving of 45 million with a new spend of 635 million. 
And then if we were to look at the uh, project business cases, we could see that actually we've got savings identified in total of 35 million with a 10 million gap. The beneficiary needs to really go back and scrutinize these projects to see whether they're delivering the capabilities that are actually going to enable them to achieve those savings targets. And similarly, if you were looking at growth metrics such as revenue and even non-financial benefits, you could be doing the same sort of thing where the beneficiary would start by looking at an overall performance metric and then looking at the contributions of all initiatives to see whether they're going to deliver value or not. So there's a, an increasing trend to actually put benefits realization back into the organization and get them to manage it as a whole rather than projects going out to try and find benefits with the organization uh, to justify their existence. An important part then of benefit realization and delivering change is about having a very clear process. Many organizations still rely on very static documents and I've shown this example here which is one of the new collaborative tools around business process management that are helping organizations to define what the current state process is, um, to then define what the future state is and then as capabilities are delivered they're able to um, adjust the processes live effectively and introduce more collaborative practices around sharing um, you know, what are the issues of our current process, what changes do we need to make, how do we resolve some of the handoffs between things, where, are we, where have we got quality fails. So some of the, the methods around lean and stigma are around driving uh, the bottom up sort of change and improvement and then from a top down more transformational perspective looking at how the technology enablers, how process change can actually transform these processes. So in this case, IT have a significant role to offer up to the business ways in which technology can help to improve process performance. And that needs to be tied back into these uh, process models. Some of you might be interested in, in this tool. Um, it's one called um, Process Knowledge, which is provided by a company called Q9 Elements, and it's uh, in a beta version. But it's well worth looking at as one of the new techniques to actually put a, establish a, a clear set of processes that people can start collaborating on and actually managing more effectively. As well as process, it's also important to be clear on your, your measures and be clear on the measures that matter. So this visual shows um, for a, an electricity company um, a way in which they manage the process by looking at the metrics at each stage. So they can be clear then on terms of as a team, so not just one functional area, but each of the areas across the process in terms of where are the current bottlenecks, where are some of the issues, and then more collectively we can find a way to actually improve performance, maybe to improve some of the upstream processes to make the downstream processes work more smoothly. But from an operational point of view, it's not just about can we actually deliver the uh, service performance, it's also about being clear about how much the process costs, looking at quality, looking at satisfaction, and getting a complete picture of these, such that when you have change coming in, you can start to identify, well, how is that going to impact my performance? And if I'm actually committing to the organization in terms of um, reducing costs or uh, reducing lead times and improving customer satisfaction, um, the ability to tie that back to, to changes which are being delivered with a clear set of metrics um, is the way that organizations ought to manage that. Um, unfortunately, many of the big IT projects risk actually going so, are so focused on actually delivering the capability that the transition into the organization is often um, challenged and if the business hasn't been clear on how it can actually leverage on the technology that's been delivered then it leads to issues in terms of uh, benefit realization and achieving targets. So just to um, give you some concluding thoughts, in improved benefit realization through collaborative practices and more integrated practices is a major opportunity for organizations and I'd expect to see leaders emerging who will drive these practices into organizations, many like your good selves. And there's a need for more people to drive benefits from an organizational perspective 
not just the projects. So the, the beneficiaries within the organization need to be actually leading this rather than having the pre projects themselves trying to help to facilitate the benefits into the organization. The organization should be actually running that as part of business as usual with potentially more people coming into the organization to actually manage the change as opposed to having the projects trying to lead it. Uh, so hopefully those, some of those insights have been of, of interest to you all. So I'd just like to hand back now to Bruce who will conclude the presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, and uh, thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, there's some vital messages, uh, I think, that came out of both of those presentations. And uh, I'd like to leave that, uh, uh, some dialogue around that until my final concluding slide. I think it's also important to make the connection between the messages that David and Andrew have been uh, providing us uh, all today with uh, what the Benefits Management Special Interest Group uh, do as a professional body on your behalf. So the first slide uh, <coughs> kind of makes some of those connections around what we have actually written down as an organization uh, in terms of vision and mission. So you can obviously read the words there for yourself, and that's absolutely fine. It isn't just about, uh, in terms of vision, it isn't just about time, cost, and performance. Uh, a recurring theme, which has clearly come out of both of what David and Andrew was talking about there, is, is, is around value. And personally, I, I kind of agree with that. Uh, value, return on investment, enabled by the right mindset and culture. Uh, mission, a bit more tactical statement, but this is about implementation at the delivery level, utility of techniques, tools, methodologies, uh, and, and experience. You know, as, as a SIG, this isn't motherhood and apple pie statements. These are real statements uh, that we have contained within a business plan, part of a strategy, uh, and as you would expect, uh, as the benefits management SIG, we have actually identified a number of benefits that we are looking at, driving forward, collaborating with a, a number of uh, wider organizations so that we can actually de deliver benefits to society, deliver benefits to you, uh, our members, our future members uh, as effectively customers. And moving on to the next slide, we have eight benefits uh, defined within our business plan. Uh, we are going to measure them all. Uh, we have started to measure them. They all belong to specific benefits management SIG uh, initiatives, which are all resourced across the, the committee, but also the wider network as well. Again, you can read those uh, benefits, and we're trying to do uh, what we preach, uh, i.e. define, prioritize, and ultimately uh, measure and realize benefits for, for you uh, or members.